This is a continuation of three phase power. Today, we're going to focus in on the per phase calculation, which allows you to take a three phase problem and convert it into a single phase equivalency. And that allows you to use the tools that you've used since the beginning of the class. Part of that is this delta to y or y to delta conversion. And then when we get to power, we'll see that the total power is three times the phase power. Again, that gets back to our per phase discussion. Before we do, let's do a quick review of the transformer. This is a quick reminder about the purpose of the transformer. We want to get power from the power plant to your home. Of course, there are many miles in between. Your home is connected to the power plant via transmission lines. For the most efficient delivery, we use a step-up transformer. And right next to your home, we use a step-down transformer. So that on the transmission line, you have high voltage but low current. Which gets back to our transformer rules, which you recall were turns on the primary over turns on the secondary is equal to the voltage on the primary as a vector over the voltage in the secondary is equal to, be careful, currents upside down, the current in the secondary over the current in the primary. So we can see that as voltage goes up, the current will go down. And of course, the other important rule that should be on your note card is the power in the primary of the transformer is equal to the complex power in the secondary. Once again, high voltage, low current on the transmission line, so you don't have high I squared R losses. Remember, we have our three phases, phase A, B, and C. The power lost in each of those wires is a function of current squared by resistance. You could lower the resistance, but that's going to be very expensive as you need thick, expensive wires, or you could lower the current. The transformer is the enabling technology that keeps the current low, and that is described in these formulas here. Let's work an example to see that in action. This is the step up transformer. We're stepping up the voltage, lowering the current. This is the step down transformer. Here's the low voltage side of transformer one, the high voltage side, the high voltage side, and the low voltage side of T2. For this problem, our starting point is 120 volts at 200 amps. We'll assume this is at an angle of zero degrees, which makes this load have a power factor of unity, which means it's pure resistive. You'll want to work your solution in this general direction, stopping at every winding on the transformer. Here's our starting point. The voltage on the secondary of T2 is given as 120 volts. The current on the secondary of T2 is given as 200 amps. Next, we move to the primary of T2. We can say the voltage on the primary of T2 is equal to 120 by 10. So that's 1,200 volts at a phase angle of zero degrees. And the current on the primary of T2 is equal to 200 divided by 10. So 20 amps at a phase angle of zero degrees. In this example, we have a 10 to 1 ratio, which is relatively easy. If you like, you can verify that those numbers were done correctly by using these formulas. The next calculation involves the secondary of T1, where we make a statement about Kirchhoff's voltage law. 
we say that the voltage on the secondary of T1 is equal to the line plus the voltage across the primary of T2. The primary of T2 is 1200 volts at a phase angle of zero degrees, and the current, excuse me, the voltage drop across the line can be calculated using Ohm's law as a current by a impedance. So that current is 20 amps, and the impedance is 5 plus J2. So the voltage on the secondary of T1 is equal to 20 at a phase angle of 0 multiplied by 5 plus 2J gives us a voltage of So that's 1200 volts plus 107, actually we'll call it 108, at a phase angle of 22 degrees. And plus 1200 and polar form. So the voltage on the secondary of T1 is equal to 1300 volts at a phase angle of 1.76 degrees. Finally, we come to the primary where we say the voltage on the primary of T1 is equal to 130 volts at a phase angle of 1.76. Is that correct? Yes, the voltage on the primary of T1 and because this is a 1 to 10 transformer, we just have to take this value and divide it by 10. The current on the primary of T1 will just be this multiplied by 10. So it's 200 amps at a phase angle of 0 degrees. While we're here, we may as well calculate the complex power. So complex power, S, the vector is equal to V I complex conjugate. So that's 130 volts at a phase angle of 1.76 by 200, because there is no phase angle associated with the current. That works out to a complex power of, now we already have the voltage loaded up into the calculator, so we multiply that by 200. That gives us 26 plus 0 0.8 J K V A, which is almost entirely real power. For giggles, let's go back and work this problem without the transformers. You would have had a schematic that looks something like this. We'll use the same resistance and reactance on the line. That's 5 plus J2. We still have 200 amps flowing through here, and we still need 120 volts on the line. The source voltage in this case would be 120 volts plus 200 amps by 5 plus J2. That's two, 200 times 5 plus 2j. And then we add in that 120. Not that it's going to make any difference. We would, without the transformer, have required about 1,200 volts to make this system work. As compared to the 130 volts we required when we had the 1 to 10, and 10 to 1 step up and step down transformers. If you look, you can see we've got a big problem. If this is 120 volts and this is 1200 volts, that means the line is dropping over a thousand volts across it. As compared to our original, where the line was only dropping 108. We can see how bad this is by calculating the I squared R loss. In this case, it's 200 amps squared by 5. 
as compared to here where we had 20 amps, so our I squared R loss was 20 squared by 5, so that's only 2,000 watts. You can see that these transformers have improved your situation by a factor of 100. Moving on, let's take a look at delta to Y and Y to delta transforms. There are three loads. This first one is a Y with a 10 plus J5 per phase impedance. Next is a delta with a 12 plus J6 per phase impedance. And then we have the capacitors with a negative J30 per phase impedance. So that means this here is 10, J5, J5, and 10. Over here, we have 12, and then J6 on the inductor, and then each capacitor would have a value of negative J30. We'll connect these up to the three-phase system. Phase A and B, C. We'll connect the neutral, even though it's not required, because this is a balanced system. There should be no current flowing in that neutral. And for the delta loads, A, B, C, and A, B, and C. Now, one of the things that you might be curious about is what is the current? So what is the line current for this particular problem? Assuming we're dealing with a 480 volt system. Remember, if it's a three-phase system and there's a voltage all by itself, that means it's an RMS voltage, and it's a voltage as measured from phase to phase. One way to solve this problem is to do a delta to a Y transform. So if the impedance of a Y is equal to the impedance of a delta divided by 3, which means we can take these two loads and we can convert them into their Y equivalents. Then we can take one leg of this Y and we can put it all together to make a per phase equivalent circuit. The result looks something like this. We have a single phase feeder. In this case, it will be 277 volts. Why 277? Because 277 volts is the difference from a phase to a neutral. So this piece right here would have seen not 480, but would have seen 480 over the square root of three. Remember that a voltage line to neutral is equal to a voltage line to line divided by root 3. In this case, it's 480 divided by the square root of 3. And there's where 277 comes from. So 277 volts on our feeder. Again, we can take this piece right here and write it directly. So that's 10 plus J5. Now we can move on to this piece of the load. This is a delta connection with a 12 plus J6 per phase impedance. We can use this equation here, which means all we need to do is divide each of those impedances by 3. The result is 4 and J2. And finally, we can address this load here, which is our capacitor. So it started out as J30 per phase. You divide that by 3, and we'll see that that's a capacitor here with a value of J10. Remember, we call this the per phase equivalent circuit. The impedance of this circuit, that's the impedance of a phase, is 1 over 10 plus J5 plus 1 over 4 plus J2 plus 1 over negative J10. You've got to watch this. See, I made a mistake there. That's negative J10 for the capacitor. Let's make sure I didn't make that mistake up here. Okay, good, I didn't. Negative J30 as the delta. 
running that through the calculator, 10 plus j5 invert plus 4 plus j2 invert plus negative 10j invert equals invert equals which gives us a total phase impedance of 3.5 plus j0.5 and a line current equal to a voltage divided by an impedance that's back to this a current cover that up that's a voltage divided by an impedance in this case it's 277 divided by 3.5 plus j 0 0.5 let's see so there is our current already in the calculator. So I'm going to divide by 277. And then I'm going to take the inverse of that. Polar form. That gives us a current, or a line current, equal to 78.3 amps at a phase angle of negative 8.1 degrees. Eli the Iceman will tell us that a negative current means that this circuit acts as if it was inductive. The complex power can be calculated as voltage by complex conjugate of the current or as the magnitude of the current squared by the impedance or as the voltage squared, excuse me, the magnitude of the voltage squared divided by the complex conjugate of the impedance. Why don't we try each of these and see if we come up with the same answer. So using the first one, complex power is 277 volts by 78.3 at a phase angle of 8.1. Notice it was negative here and it's positive here, which means we took care of the complex conjugate which gives us 277 times 78.3 at a phase angle of 8.1. So complex power is 21.5 plus 3.1 kVA. Using this metric, we would have said complex power is equal to the current squared so that's 78.3 squared multiplied by the impedance, which we calculated here as 3.5 plus J0.5. Let's see how that works out. So that's 78.3 squared multiplied by 3.5 plus 0.5 J should give us the same answer. It looks like it does. So that's 21.5 plus about 3.1 kVA. Once again, this time, complex power is the voltage squared, correction, the magnitude of the voltage squared, so 277 squared over the complex conjugate of the impedance, so that's 3.5 minus J0.5. So the complex power is 277 squared divided by 3.5 minus 0.5j is the same number we saw before. So 21.5 plus about 3.1 kVA. It's good to see that there is some consistency here. Just as a reminder, on the DC side of the house, power was IE, was also equal to I squared R, was equal to voltage squared divided by R. That's the DC side, and this is the AC side. The power triangle looks something like this. So 21.5 kW real power. 3 k vars, 
And if we put that into the calculator as polar form, that gives us 21.7 kVA at an angle of about 8.1 degrees. To understand this, let's take a look back. So we started this problem as a three phase 480 volt feeder with three loads. We did a conversion where we converted to a per phase equivalent circuit. And then we calculated the power for that particular phase. Which means that the total power is three times what we've done here. So you could look at it this way. You could say, here's a power triangle for the A phase. Here's a power triangle for the B phase. And here's a power triangle for the C phase. And if you put all of those together, we end up with one great big triangle representing the entire three phase system. So in this case, it's three times that. So 21 and a half becomes about 64 kW and 65 kW and about 9.2 kVar. So this is a representation of the power for the entire three phase system. If we wanted to write that mathematically, we would say that the complex power total is equal to three times the power in a phase. Might be helpful if we actually wrote these steps down. So one, you're given a three phase system with multiple loads. You'll want to convert to a per phase equivalent circuit. Typically, this is a Y configuration. We'll use the delta to Y conversions. And remember that the voltage line to neutral is equal to the voltage line to line divided by the square root of 3. At this point, you can solve for the line current and the complex power. Remember that complex power is a voltage times the complex conjugate of the current, the magnitude of the current vector squared by the impedance is also equal to the magnitude of the voltage vector squared divided by the complex conjugate of the impedance. And the last step is to convert back into a three phase system. As far as power is concerned, think of that as three smaller triangles representing the power in each phase. And since power is additive, we can then calculate a larger power triangle representing the power for the entire load. We'll look at one more example and then call it a day. Think of this as a three-phase generator. This as the power cables leading to the load. And the load in this case is a three phase delta connected load. We'll assume 480 volts, which is a phase to phase voltage. We'll assume a line of 300 plus J200. And we'll assume a load with a six plus J3 per phase impedance. So that means this inductor would be J3 and this resistor would be six ohms. One way to solve this problem is to convert it to the equivalent Y circuit. I should have mentioned we are looking for the total complex power. Multiple ways to solve this. One way is to convert it to the equivalent Y circuit. So the impedance of a Y is equal to the impedance of a delta divided by three. And the voltage line to neutral is the voltage line to line divided by the square root of three. The per phase equivalency looks like this. This is a 277 volt source. 
the line is 300 plus J200. By the way, I forgot something up here. This is milliohms. Otherwise, this problem doesn't make any sense. So that's 300 plus J200 milliohms. All right. At 300 ohms, you'd have no power going to the load. Speaking of the load, that is now ran through this equation. So the load resistor is 2, and the reactance is J1. Solving for current, that is a voltage divided by an impedance, which is 277. We'll assume an angle of 0 degrees divided by 2.3 plus J1.2. That's 2 ohms here, plus 0.3 there, and a reactance of J1 plus 0.2 there. The current is equal to 277 divided by 2.3 plus 1.2 J. So the current is about 170 amps at a phase angle of negative 27.6 degrees. The complex power per phase, because remember, this was a three-phase system. We converted it into a Y equivalent. And now we're calculating the complex power, but only for that Y piece. So it's only one of three. So the complex power of the phase is a voltage by the complex conjugate of the current. So S phase is equal to 277 by 107 phase angle, 27.6. Be careful, complex conjugate there. So that is 277 times pren 107 phase angle 27.6 gives us a complex power per phase of 26.3 plus, looks like 13.7 kVA. Once again, there are three phases. So you could think of this as three little power triangles that come together to make the total power. The complex power total is equal to three times the complex power of a phase. Complex power total is therefore about 78.8 plus J41.2 kVA. So that's that number, whoops. It's that number, which is already in our calculator, multiplied by 3. So that should give you, there's your 78.8. And there's your 41.2. Go into polar mode. It's about 89 kVA, about 79 kW, and about 41 kVar. All at an angle of... 27 or about 28 degrees. The power factor is equal to the cosine of theta. The power factor is also equal to the ratio of real power to apparent power. Let's see if that works out. So cosine of 28 degrees and we also have 79 is to 89. So let's see if those are equal. So the cosine of 28 degrees gives us approximately 88%. And 79 divided by 89 should give us about the same thing. So about 88%, give or take a little bit of rounding. With the stipulation that it is inductive. Do remember that power factor alone does not tell you if the circuit is inductive or capacitive. 
So typically you'll see a stipulation after power factor. If it's not given, most of the time it's safe to assume that you're dealing with an inductive circuit because most of our loads are indeed inductive. Well, that's about it. That takes care of today's discussion. However, I wanted to point something out to you. In the near future, we're going to be talking about motors. And it turns out that the model of a motor looks a lot like that. And the model of a generator looks a lot like that. If you put them together, you're going to have the generator on a per phase basis and the motor on a per phase basis. And we're going to go and draw these power triangles the same way. The only difference is now instead of talking about 79 kW, we're going to be doing a conversion into horsepower where there is 746 watts per horsepower. So we would talk about this particular power being about 105 horsepower. In this example, 79 kW represents the power going into the motor. That's 79 kilowatts entering, about 100 horsepower mechanical leaving, and we'll lose several kilowatts along the way. Due to I squared R losses in the windings, core losses, and things like windage and friction.